Hello and welcome to this video on Othello by Shakespeare. Today we're going to look at Act 1, Scene 3 and I'm splitting the scene into several parts because there's quite a lot um, to talk about in it. So this video is going to be reasonably short and we're just going to look at the opening few pages of this scene. Now remember we're always looking for a big question in each scene so that we can link the specifics of it to the key concepts that Shakespeare was exploring. And today's question is, why does Shakespeare interleave political and personal events in the play? The um, tragedy of Othello is often referred to as a domestic tragedy because in many ways it is intensely personal. We're looking at the relationship between a husband and a wife, the final murder, sorry to, to give away the spoilers, um, the final murder of Desdemona takes place within a bedroom setting and so it is intensely personal. However, despite that, throughout the play there are references to Othello's political role because we must never forget that as well as being a husband, um, he is also the general in the Venetian army and he has been sent to Cyprus in order to combat the threat to the stability of the Venetian Republic that is posed by the Turkish Empire and Othello's role is also to secure the kind of outlying settlements of Venice and therefore to secure the eastern border really of, the, of, of Europe and European culture. So Othello plays an important political role in the play as well as a personal one. The plot so far, um, we've seen in Act 1, Scene 1, that Shakespeare establishes a very racist setting for the play. Um, we see this particularly in his presentation of Iago, Rodrigo and Brabantio, when Iago and Rodrigo spill the beans about Othello's elopement with Desdemona. Um, in Act 1, Scene 2, we meet Othello for the first time and Shakespeare challenges those racist ideas by presenting Othello as being very rational. Um, we hear all about the marriage and this is going to be a point of contention in Act 1, Scene 3, where the Duke is going to decide whether or not Othello can stay married to Desdemona. So looking at the scene then, the, the first section of Act 1, Scene 2, um, I'm going to skip it often comes across as being a little bit boring. I think it probably is quite important. Um, but in that section, basically lots of the, the people from the army um, and the, the, the politicians of the day are discussing the Turkish invasion. And the news comes that the Turkish fleet has set out to attack the Venetian garrison that's on Cyprus. Um, and basically everyone realises that they've got to do something in order to protect this garrison and the Duke is going to get Othello to go and do that. And then Othello enters um, the scenery, um, the, the political space and the Duke welcomes in valiant Othello, we must straight employ you against the general enemy Ottoman. So we've got to get you to lead our army against this Turkish threat. And then he says, as a, almost as an aside to Brabantio, oh, I didn't see you there. Welcome, gentle signor, we lacked your counsel and your help tonight. So you weren't here in the discussion about Turkey. Brabantio says, so did I yours. Good your grace, pardon me. Neither my place nor aught I have heard of business hath raised me from my bed. So this Turkish threat isn't what's got me up out of bed in the middle of the night. Nor doth the general care take hold on me for my particular grief. So his personal grief about Desdemona is of so floodgate and overbearing nature that it engulfs and swallows other sorrows and is still itself. So Brabantio is saying that he's very distracted because he's had a personal tragedy that in his mind is much more important than the Turkish threat to the Cypriot garrison. And the Duke says, why, what's, what's the matter, what's happened? Brabantio laments his daughter, oh my daughter, and Senator One, what a wonderful part, says dead. Um, so as your daughter died, I mean, Brabantio is being so melodramatic that everybody thinks that can be the only explanation for it. Now, this welcome to Othello, valiant Othello, is really significant. You'll remember this um, from the start of Macbeth, where um, Macbeth is described as being valiant, and then at the end of Macbeth, it's Banquo has taken Macbeth's place, in a sense, and he's described as being valiant. And it's a really important word because it encapsulates all the sense of courage on the battlefield um, that was important for a tragic hero of the time. So the Duke is saying, Valiant Othello, you are courageous, you're a leader of my army, um, I hold you in high regard, high, uh, I've got a lot of respect for you. And of course that's very different from the racist um, 
accusations and, and slurs that the other characters have been throwing at Othello already in the play. So when we meet the Duke, he's established as someone um, who is much more liberal, much more progressive, much more inclusive in juxtaposition against someone like Brabantio. Then the Duke really emphasises the urgency of the situation. We must straight employ you. So must that modal verb, stressing the importance of it, straight indicates you've got to do this straight away, you've got to leave now tonight. So kind of ramping up the tension and the urgency of the situation. And then I don't know whether this is supposed to be almost a comic section of the scene, but certainly I think it could be played um, in quite a funny way. And the Duke says to Brabantio, we lacked your counsel and your help tonight. You weren't here to help us talk about the Turkish invasion. Um, and we've seen Brabantio be waken up, wakened up by Iago and Rodrigo, and we've seen him running around. But in terms of the time frame of the play, that's really fairly recent. So actually, while the Duke has been debating, deliberating what to do with his senators, Brabantio has been fast asleep in bed or doing whatever he was doing. Um, and the only reason he's got up is not to help with the political situation, but to talk about his daughter and what's been done to him personally. So I don't know if this is a, a decent theory, but I think that what Shakespeare might be doing here is suggesting that Brabantio is in his political role a little bit incompetent. And then that reflects on his personal role as a father. You know, if Brabantio hasn't been prepared to get up, if he hasn't had his finger on the pulse and been involved in what's going on politically, then how is he supposed to be on top of things personally? And similarly, it could work vice versa, couldn't it? So if Brabantio hasn't noticed that his daughter is paying a lot of attention to Othello, then as a politician, as a senator, um, a member of the seniory, is he able to notice things which are maybe slightly more important for the survival of the state? So I think to answer our big question in, in some senses, one of the reasons why Shakespeare's interleaving this political and personal is to show that Brabantio is maybe a little bit incompetent as a character and to make him almost seem like a comic character in this scene. And then that, of course, alienates the audience from him. You know, we're looking at him, laughing at him possibly, thinking that this guy doesn't know what's going on. And if we're alienated from him, then we're also alienated from his racist ideas. We've seen, seen something really similar with Mr. Burling in an Inspector Coles. So at the start of an Inspector Coles, um, Priestley establishes Mr. Burling as a symbol for capitalism, but he also makes him a really unlikable character. And because we don't like Mr. Burling, we don't like what he says about capitalism. And a really similar thing could possibly be going on here. You could argue this in tentative language. We don't like Brabantio. We think he's ridiculous. We think he's incompetent. Therefore, we don't like the values that he stands for, which includes racism. So Brabantio, I think this would be played really melodramatically, really over the top. And he says his particular grief, his personal grief is of so floodgate and overbearing nature. So if you imagine um, a floodgate, um, or maybe a burst river bank or something like that um, happens every year in the UK <laughs> during the winter in some part of the, the country. Um, water bursting the banks, overflowing with a sudden rush of water. And what Prabandi is saying is that his emotions are like that. Now that he's realised what's happened, his emotions have completely taken over him. Um, and he's been engulfed by it. He's been swallowed um, by it and everything else has been obliterated for him. Now, we could just look at this as Brabantio melodramatically saying how upset he is. But there's actually a motif all the way through the play of emotions taking over rational thought, which is what Brabantio is describing here. At the start of Act 2, Scene 1, um, Othello talks about Desdemona as being his soul's joy, and he seems to be overwhelmed by his love for her, and he forgets for a moment that he's in public and he's the leader of the army, that he's the political leader. And then in Act 2, Scene 3, Othello has to make a political decision. Um, there's been a huge fight. Cassio seems to be the, the main instigator of the fight, although Iago's actually put him in that position. And Othello has got to decide how to punish Cassio. Um, and 
what actually happens is that instead of making a rational political choice, Othello's emotions overwhelm him and his emotions lead him to making a decision, which is to demote Cassio from his role in the army. So we see this pattern throughout the play of emotions engulfing the individual and then guiding a political decision. Um, and so that's just a, it's an interesting motif. And I suppose one of the things that Shakespeare is interested in exploring is how do you how do you create a good leader how do you create someone who's going to act responsibly and who's not going to let their personal problems their emotions guide the way um so for example if we're thinking about king james the first um and witchcraft to do with Macbeth and so on um king james the first when his wife was traveling over um to to england um she was caught in a massive storm and james said that this could have been caused by witches and he uses this a personal example to reinforce his very public his very political diatribe against witches so one of the things i suppose that shakespeare is exploring is what happens when a leader is kind of overtaken by the these emotional situations and then Brabantio goes on, and we've seen this theme before, it's very familiar to us. To us. Um, he's saying that um, Desdemona's been abused, she's been stolen, she's been corrupted, and there's that objectification of women there, which we'll look at later in this. And then he's talking about spells and medicines of witchcraft, so going on again in this very racist theme that we talked about in the previous video. Um, and this is really interesting, he talks about how nature could so preposterously err. So preposterous means ridiculous, to err means to make a mistake. And what he's saying here is that it's somehow unnatural for Desdemona to have married Othello. And this is the fundamental idea of racism and the fundamental problem that, that Brabantio has with this marriage is that it's unnatural. And, but because Brabantio is appearing in this really ridiculous way, the audience is going to dismiss this idea, or perhaps Shakespeare is prompting the audience to dismiss this idea as itself being preposterous, being ridiculous. And then the Duke responds, whoever he be, so whoever has done this to you, whoever has stolen your daughter and married her and abused her or whatever, even though our proper son, so even if he's my own son, he's going to get punished. And Brabantio says, thank you very much. Here is the man, this more. And then the Duke changes because this is a massive problem for him. He's just promised justice to Brabantio to the full extent of the law, but he never in a million years imagined that Othello would be the one who'd married Desdemona. And Othello, we know, is the one who absolutely must, it's imperative, it's urgent, he must lead the army to fight the imminent Turkish threat. And so we see here the political and the personal are clashing. The Duke wants to give Brabantio personal justice, but now he can't because that clashes with his political decision of sending Othello um, to lead the army. And so the Duke now has to resolve this in some way, and that's what we'll look at in the next video. Now, a bit of independent learning for you to do on Brabantio. Um, I've put some good vocabulary words down the side here. Um, these are words I've chosen that might unlock concepts, unlock ideas about Brabantio. And I'd like you to go back through Act 1, Scenes 1 to 3, and find evidence from those scenes that support these ideas. And then a final question, what ideas does Brabantio symbolise in the play, and how do you know this? Okay, thank you very much for listening, and in the next video we're going to look at Othello's speech of defence in Act 1, Scene 3.